Please welcome the Chair of the Climate Change Commission, ladies and gentlemen, Rod Carr. In a mana in a iwi, tenakoto kata, ko rod ka aho, kai fokahire, ho parangi, Climate Change Commission. Well done, Lord Devon. What I thought I would use my time today to talk to you about is briefly the work of the Climate Change Commission and the advice that we've provided to government. Perhaps a refutation of some of the things that the Commission is asserted to have said that we didn't say, and an outline of the program of work that lies ahead. So let's start briefly with some of the findings and advice that the Climate Change Commission has provided to the government. I am assuming, while a number of you may have waded through 400 pages of advice, over 600 pages of evidence, and some of the 15,500 submissions now published on our website, most of you haven't. The Commission is tasked under the Climate Change Response Act for providing advice on the direction of policy to the government of the day on a wide range of matters relating to climate. But the starting piece of work was advice on the direction of policy necessary to achieve the statutory targets which Parliament has approved and put into legislation for New Zealand. And there are only three of them, so they're quite easy to remember. The first statutory target is that New Zealand will reduce our biogenic methane emissions by 10% from our 2017 levels by 2030 and by 24 to 47% by 2050, and that we will have net zero emissions of long-lived gases by 2050. Three statutory targets. Of course, the government was not alone in setting those targets. 119 members of parliament, David Seymour was absent that day, all voted for those targets and put them in legislation. When they set the targets, they didn't quite know how they'd achieve them. That's why they wanted some advice. They wanted advice that would be seen as independent from any particular political party or stakeholder or interest group. They wanted advice that would be seen as evidence-based and expert. They wanted advice to guide the direction of policy, but not to write specific rules or regulations. And they wanted that advice promptly, urgently, sooner the better. So the Commission started where the Interim Climate Change Committee had got to, and was able to build on both that body of work and pinch some of their staff. And we started our work at the end of 2019, put our draft advice out for consultation on the 1st of February this year, and finalized that advice at the end of May. So what did we conclude? Well, the first thing we concluded is that current policy settings for New Zealand will not and do not put us on a pathway to achieve the statutory targets, that we will exceed the emissions levels in the legislation unless we change some things. We also concluded that there are indeed a range, not a single choice, a range of pathways, plural, that New Zealand could follow that would be consistent with those targets. And those pathways were technically feasible, economically affordable, and likely to be socially acceptable, but we needed to get on with action now. 
So let us just very quickly recap. Half of New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions come from biogenic methane, of which 90% of that half comes from agriculture and about 10% from waste. That New Zealand is an outlier in that we have the largest proportion of biogenic methane as a proportion of all our emissions of any country in the world. The closest to us is Ireland at 35% of their greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the challenges for biogenic methane emissions is that while better waste management and a reduction of waste could materially reduce biogenic methane from waste, there are not well-known, widely adopted technologies to reduce biogenic methane emissions from ruminant pastoral livestock. It is the case that the Commission's conclusion is that as a result of land use change over the coming decade, largely sheep and beef lamb to forestry and some dairy land to horticulture, and the much broader adoption of the already known better breeding and feeding practices, biogenic methane emissions from agriculture could be reduced by a little over 10% this decade. But to achieve that, our recommendation is the government should provide more extensive support for the wider adoption of those known better practices across the agricultural sector. We also conclude that the likelihood of achieving even the lower end of the 24 to 47% emissions of reduction for biogenic methane by 2050, even achieving the lower end of that with any degree of certainty, is unlikely in the absence of changed practices by the adoption of new technologies that will reduce biogenic methane emissions from ruminant livestock. And that's why we also recommend the government must continue to and indeed step up its support for research that could lead to changes in breeding and feeding and additives, including vaccines, which may reduce the amount of biogenic methane from the digestion of plant matter. That doesn't guarantee that solutions will be found, but we should not stint in our efforts to seek them. Secondly, the Commission concluded that of the other 50% of our greenhouse gas emissions, 40% comes from transport, and that unless we decarbonized ground transportation, there is no prospect of us achieving our statutory targets or meeting our international obligations under the Paris Agreement. The decarbonization of ground transportation can be achieved in many different ways with many different mixes of choices. But the one choice that we have made that we must abandon is buying some of the highest emitting, oldest, dirtiest, second-hand cars in the world because they are cheap. That ground transportation can be substituted in some cases by mode shift. That means more walking, biking, public transport to displace high emitting journeys. In some cases can be reduced by having better emission standards from new to New Zealand vehicles. Can in some cases be reduced by swapping out older internal combustion engine technology for no or low emissions alternatives, including but not limited to battery electric potentially fuel cell hydrogen.
But all of that requires that both market prices are allowed to play their part, that barriers to better choices are reduced, and enablers are promoted. The direction of policy is clear. We need to move some freight onto low emissions transport technologies such as rail and near shore marine. We need to move some of the journeys we travel into lower and no emissions modes. But even so, the Commission concludes that by 2035, 60% of all the privately owned and operated vehicles in this country will be internal combustion engine. We conclude that by 2035, we will still be using two thirds of the current petajoules of liquid fossil fuels. So to promote the concept that suddenly our advice is that we outlaw vehicles which have high emissions before new technologies available is factually wrong and mischievous. It is not the recommendation of the Commission, it is not the direction of vice, and it is not helpful to misrepresent it. Further, we need to reduce emissions from low and medium temperature process heat. Combusting fossil fuels in the open air is the source of 80% of the planet's greenhouse gas emissions. And for New Zealand, it is transport and process heat that are the drivers. In process heat, there are already known alternatives including biomass, biogas, biodiesel, renewable electricity, and more efficient use of already existing and deployed technologies. While the Commission focuses on reducing the capital waste of continuing to invest in old, high-emitting technologies, we do not recommend that we rip out gas pipelines or early scrap plant and equipment. An affordable transition is one that we get underway now and that we maintain momentum on over the decades to come so that technologies may reach the end of their useful lives and be replaced in an orderly way. How we generate energy is the other significant source of actual emissions. 40% of all the energy used in New Zealand today comes from renewable sources, which means 60% of all of our energy is from fossil fuels since we don't do nuclear. The Commission's advice is that that is the proportion of all energy used and produced that matters, and that is the proportion that we need to relentlessly drive towards renewables over the decades to come. And while it is true that we generate 80 to 85 percent of our electricity from renewables, and that a larger proportion would be better, the interim committee concluded that that last few percent of electricity being from renewables may be very expensive compared to raising the proportion of all energy that is from renewables. In other words, swapping out more diesel and gas may be lower hanging fruit than getting the last percentage of all electricity from renewables. So the challenge for New Zealand is that no single source of emissions alone, no single industry, no single technology alone is enough to achieve our domestic targets. That setting up a contest between urban New Zealand and rural New Zealand is unhelpful. 
because we all need to be supporting the action that needs to be taken. Everybody in any role that they have needs to develop the understanding of the emissions profile of their supply chain, of their business and household activities, of their channels to market. Because one thing is pretty clear, is that markets will play their part in driving us towards a lower emissions society. And that means that investments will be stranded and abandoned in an old technology world, that new investments represent new opportunities in a greener, healthier world, but that consumer preferences, not just through prices, but through choices, will determine the profitability of your businesses this decade. In the work in the demonstration path, which is not a central plan for New Zealand, the Commission looks at a coherent and integrated series of interactions that could define a path along which New Zealand could travel that would be consistent with emissions budgets aligned to achieving our domestic targets. On that demonstration path, which is subject to some alternatives for comparative analysis and sensitivity analysis for tests of robustness, we see that the shadow price or implied price of one tonne of carbon dioxide emissions rises to about $140 by 2030 and to $250 by 2050 as we are left with the very hard to abate emissions in the middle of this century. So if you don't understand the emissions profile of your supply chain, your business processes, and your channels to market, you will not see coming the change in costs and relative prices that lie ahead of you. Be careful. The shadow price is not a forecast of the NZU price in the emissions trading system. Only half of New Zealand's current greenhouse gas emissions are covered in the emissions trading scheme. The emissions trading scheme has flaws and trigger prices for releases of reserves. The emissions trading scheme has over 120 million tonnes of available credits in the bank that can and might be released over the years to come. The emissions trading scheme is incomplete, allocates significant amounts of credits to high emitting trade exposed businesses. The emissions trading scheme is poorly regulated and like all markets is subject to the limits that any market has. But price will play its part. Markets are powerful in allocating resources, as well you all know. The Commission's conclusion is that the emissions trading scheme has a significant part to play in any pathway to our statutory targets. But that markets need mates, and that market prices alone will not deliver the transition that we require in the time that we have to achieve it. That under the Climate Change Response Act, the Commission's advice needs to take into account a wide range of matters of which cost is but one. We must have regard for the impact on land use. We must have regard for the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. We must have regard for the intergenerational equity of our advice. We must have regard for the impact that our advice, if taken, would have on New Zealand, not just in aggregate, but across our regions and provinces. And that is why, to those who say we should just let the market do the work, 
I say as a true believer in markets that you need to understand the limits of markets. Markets are myopic. They sh sincerely face the short-term inevitability of cash constraints. Markets discount the future too heavily, giving unborn generations no voice and no vote. Markets do not handle well asymmetric risk, where catastrophic events of low probability are ignored because we have designed markets to essentially privatize gains and socialize losses. And markets have never professed to deal with the distribution of costs and benefits. The market athletes argue that markets are so efficient that the gains are so much larger that we can trust tax and redistribution to compensate the losers. The last 40 years of history is full of abundant evidence that the winners are unwilling to give up their wins to help compensate the losers. So for all those reasons, markets must be the best they can be, but still cannot be relied on to achieve the emissions reductions that we must. Lord Devon has provided you with an insight of how New Zealand might be seen in the eyes of the world. And that leads me very clearly to another piece of advice that the minister required us to give. He wanted advice on whether our nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement was consistent with holding global temperature rises to not more than 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And the conclusion that the Commission reached is that our current nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement, which was to reduce New Zealand's net emissions by 2030 by 30% from our gross emissions in 2005, was not consistent with our obligations under the Paris Agreement, and that we'd, we would need to do much more than a 36% reduction to meet those obligations. So we are talking about the world holding New Zealand to account for promises that we have already signed up to under the Paris Agreement. New Zealand as a small trading nation is utterly dependent on the multilateral world order. We depend on multilateralism for our defense and our access to markets. We have signed the Paris Treaty. We will need to deliver our obligation under it if we are to be able to hold other nations to account for their promises, not only under that agreement, but under our own trade agreements. So what might that mean? In the first two weeks of November, New Zealand will be on the world stage to explain and justify our current emissions profile and our plans to reduce emissions in line with our treaty obligations. And by the end of this year, the government will have signed up for our first emissions budgets which run out till 2035, and a reduction plan consistent with and to give effect to those budgets. There is no doubt the climate is changing. There is no doubt that human activity is causing it. There is no doubt that only through collective global action can we address this issue. And there is no doubt that New Zealand has signed up to play our part. So have no doubt your world is changing now. Kira. Ladies and gentlemen, a couple of questions have come through for Rod Carr. So Rod, if you would mind coming back to the stage, I wonder
For our sound crew, if we could fire up that lectern and, and Rod can stand there, that'll be great. Uh, the first of the questions, Rod, is where does New Zealand sit re-emissions per capita by country globally? So New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions, and these are rounded numbers, you can look them up on the web if you want to get the exact ones. Gross emissions is measured in the international standard of global warming potential over 100 years. All gases, gross emissions around 16 tonnes per capita per annum for each man, woman and child in New Zealand. If we were to take all of agricultural emissions out, that's half of it, and just look at the eight tonnes per capita that's left, that is twice the per capita emissions of India or China, where you include everything in their emissions. So if you look at our emissions per capita, it is high, higher than you would expect in most developed countries, largely because of our biogenic methane emissions. But even if you set that to one side, our emissions per capita are high because of the way we use transport. So New Zealand transport emissions, which are 40% of the non-agricultural half, around 20% of all our emissions, run in the order of three and a quarter tonnes for each of us, for transport. And that's why we need to deal with that. So when the world looks at New Zealand, they not only look at our total level of emissions, that's the gross amount, they not only think about how it's made up, but they observe that our emissions have not been reducing, even although we have been a party first to the Kyoto Protocol and subsequently to the Paris Agreement. So it's not just a question of what it is per capita or what it is in total, but also a question of how it's made up and whether we have available technologies and choices that the world believes we could use to reduce those emissions. And let me quickly <laughs> say what the world sees when it looks at New Zealand is first a wealthy country, secondly a country that has contributed about twice the per capita average over our history, a country that's profited from those emissions over a century. But more importantly, a country that as a sovereign nation can choose not to use nuclear power, can choose not to dam our flowing rivers, can choose not to use genetic editing to reduce our greenhouse gas footprint, can choose to import some of the highest polluting motor vehicles in the world because they're cheap. What we can as a sovereign nation no longer choose is not to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you, Rod. Ladies and gentlemen, if you do have any more questions for Rod, please feel free to come up and have a chat with him. Rod, are you here? How long for the rest I'll of the- I'll be here for the morning. Here for the morning. Yep. So if you have any more questions for Rod, please feel free to go up and put them to him. Ladies and gentlemen, Rod yep. Carr.